I'm going to quickly start off with the main library um, search engine called Library Search, just in case you guys haven't used it often because it doesn't cover legislation and case law. If that's mainly what you've been using, you may not have quite used this as often. So I'll just so quickly run through a couple of things around searching, downloading stuff, saving your searches, saving results, that sort of shenanigans, um, very, very briefly. And then we'll move on to something a bit more advanced. So I'm going to do legal personhood and animals. Because I know there's stuff there. <laughs> and I know because and I know you like that game, so I just sort of throw it in there for you. So just a really basic search. Take like a thousand years. Because my internet is also slow. I'm actually at home doing this, so my internet's a bit slow here as well, unfortunately. Okay. So you can sign in to get results, request items, and that sort of thing. So obviously the ones that are online, which is a whole bunch of them, um, you'd click on the item in question and then jump onto the online resource by clicking on the link. Um, now, is there anything that actually is in print? I might just go available in the library. In terms of stuff that's in print physically, if for some reason it was actually out, this one isn't, so it's fine. You could request the item and it will then get, um, someone will go away and put a reserve on it and make the person who has it bring it back within a week or so. And then when it does turn up, you'll get an email saying it's here and you can pick it up in the library. So just in case you've not used that function, that's how it, how it works. And the other thing you can do is you can actually save particular items or particular searches. So you can save a particular item you quite want to read again to, by clicking on a little pin next to it. And it goes up to the magic pinned items thingy. Or um, you can save a whole search if you want to. Save this query. And you can turn on, on notifications so that when more searches, more results come up later on through other stuff we've bought um, that match your query, you'll get an email saying there's some more stuff there, go have a look. And in terms of accessing those items again, click on go to my favorites and you'll see your saved records, your saved searches and your particular search history as well. So just in terms of getting around library search and some things that perhaps you didn't know about necessarily, um, they are quite useful things to know. Cool, we'll go away from that now. Because other than that, things are, you know, it's really easy to use. You throw some keywords in and get some results back effectively. Um, it's got a really, like I say, a really good coverage of online materials, both print and journal articles and things, but doesn't cover statutes and case law, so which is why I suspect some of you, particularly if you're coming in to honours, not having done many third year papers either, um, you may not have used library search quite so often. So I thought I'd just give you a heads up. Actually, um, before we go any further, have you guys used the new West Law yet? West Law New Zealand? Yes, so maybe. I have. You have, yeah? Uh, yeah, just briefly, I have, yeah. Cool. Um, I just wanted to be useful to quickly jump in and you know, show you around just in case, because um, it was going to be the next thing. So that's, if that would be useful for anybody, let me know and I'll do that now. Cool. Okay. So I will jump in and quickly show you. So I just tend to go into the portal all the time for some weird reason. Um, but you can also get in through library databases and through just typing it into the library search thing as well. But law. So what happened is that at the end of last year, the old West Law NZ got retired. So if you've got bookmarks and stuff back to the old platform, they won't work anymore in theory. And it was replaced with West Law New Zealand. It has the same content, but it looks a bit different. And there are some annoying quirks about searching it as well. So first of all, 
when you jump on to Westlaw New Zealand, you'll get a second um, prompt login and it claims it wants a Thomson Reuters one pass. That's a lie. It actually just wants your normal Waikato username and password. But just make sure it doesn't try to put um, waikato.ac.nz before your username because that will make the um, login fail. So make sure it's just your actual username. In my case, it's MAP because I'm a staff member. But for you guys, it's probably your initials and um, a number. So you've had a few students, particularly first years who haven't used this before, have that issue. So I thought I'd bring it up. So logging in. Um, one of the good new features with the new platform is that it can actually allow you to save searches and stuff. So, um, yeah, I'll show you how to do that. And it also, which is something I discovered really recently and should have known myself earlier, if you do searches in the international platform, it will actually jump into those as well. Um, so I can show you my own search history because I've done some stuff. The other, oh, for goodness sake. Really? Hang on. That wasn't supposed to happen, so I'm not entirely sure what went on there. Hopefully it'll play nicely now. Okay, so if that happens to you, like it just happened to me, because um, it was being a dick, um, if you scroll down the page, there was an option to sign in through a New Zealand institution, and because I was logged into Waikato stuff anyway, it signed me in, finally. But that Thompson Rules one pass thing should actually work. Okay, so... Here we are in West Law, New Zealand. Um, one of the things it likes to try and do is try and predict what you want um, if you just type some stuff into the database. So I'll just start with, um, I don't know, section 14 or section 11 of the Wills Act. So all I needed to type in was Wills 11, and it knew it actually wanted section 11 of the Wills Act which is pretty smart. It doesn't always get it right and there are better ways of searching if it's not giving you what you really want. But in this example of actually, sometimes it can be quite smart in predicting what you're after. And so from here, here is section 11 of the Wills Act and we can see citing references and cases and whatnot by clicking on citing references. And it gives us both commentary and the secondary sources and journal articles and stuff there too, if you're lucky. And also cases under cases. So back in the day with the old platform, we use those tabs to find related materials. With this new one, it's the citing references thing. So that's, yeah, that's how you do it. And if you're getting too many results, like there's 300 there, you can actually go search within results and um, type in extra keywords. So this is just New Zealand material as well. And it's relatively recent. The most recent case on there seems to be from last week. Um, I found with Dogby doing some of the stuff for the first years that for some reason, cases seem to get onto West Law quicker they get onto Lexis. So if the same case is going to eventually appear on both databases, it will appear here first by a couple of weeks usually. So just be aware that if you're looking for ridiculously recent stuff, that West Law might be your better bet, but only if it's stuff in the last couple of weeks. Otherwise, it doesn't really matter either way, as long as it's from a sufficiently high level of the courts. I'll just jump into slightly older case and see if it's got some key type things. One of the things that that case is doing here as well sometimes, and hopefully this is one of them, that's not, that's annoying, is they'll often give you a, a whole bunch of categories under which the case falls and you can click on the category and go to everything that's actually, actually classified that way. This one doesn't do that, which is annoying, but a lot of them do. So that's in terms of finding stuff, how you do that. 
Um, if the magic predicting thing didn't work and you were looking for legislation in particular, you just use the advanced templates. So to do that, you click on legislation and then click on advanced up the top there to get a legislation specific advanced template. The top couple of fields are just general search term type fields. But as we scroll down, we get the legislation title and provision fields, which will give you that much more targeted search. So if you're not getting what you want by magically typing stuff into that top box, come and do a more targeted search um, using the advanced templates. And that applies to case law as well. If you clicked on cases, then clicked on advanced, you get an advanced search template that's specific to case law. So I thought I'd just show you that. Um, in terms of just doing a keyword search across the database, Where I'm actually might only have a spell. Okay, now I can spell correctly. I'm keeping legal personhood together in their order by shoving quote marks around them. And I want the word environment. But actually, I want them in the same paragraph as each other. So I'm hoping this works. I've not actually tried this search. So I'm just giving it a punt and hoping it gets something back, which is possibly a bit dangerous in a tutorial, but never mind. Anyway, so if you are looking for term, like doing a search across everything or across an area of case law where you know you're going to get thousands of results, to narrow things down, you can use these things called proximal, um, proximal searching. And that's where if you put slash P, you can get something, a term in the same paragraph, slash S in the same sentence, slash by within five words of each other. So that's a way of narrowing stuff down. If you know that those particular terms will be in your result list and you kind of want to make sure they're close together so it makes the results more relevant. And it also works in Lexis as well. The annoying trick with this database is if you don't put either the word and or one of those proximity things in, it will think you want either one or the other and try and search for both, you know, either or, rather than searching for both of them. So I found a thing on Tea Hanger at least. Um, obviously, this was too much of a specific search. Um, but still, that is how it works. And so it's the thing about the Fagunoi River, River, I suspect. So you might want to do, might want to start off with quite a narrow search as that, but I just wanted to show you how the proximal searching thing worked in the database. Um, another thing you might find useful is A to Z. It's actually got a whole bunch of the textbooks cut up and stuck into the database. So if you can't get access to either the print version or the normal electronic version, uh, yeah, I can show you where the help thing is for the searching there. Um, you can go into the A to Z and hopefully you might find it there if it's a top of Reuters publication. So things like the crimes textbook is mostly under criminal law. Um, if you are doing research in constitutional and administrative law, most of Joseph falls under admin and constitutional law. Um, if you're doing health law later on, the health law textbook's that one. There's a human rights New Zealand textbook that actually sits there mostly. The land law one is, is mostly under land law or Maori land law as well. So yeah, there are a, whole, a few bits and pieces if you can't get hold of the real textbook, you can use this as a kind of like a back door um, in the meantime. But yeah, so actually someone asked me about where those magic things were for proximal searching and stuff. Um, obviously I just use them so they're in my head, but if you're not me, um, if you go up to search tips, it's there. So the basic ones, you know, phrases plus and minus, and these ones work in Google as well as they work anywhere else. So these basic ones with the quote marks and the plus and the minus to include and exclude. Um, 
work, like research, Google, Lexus everywhere. These more specialized ones, slash S, slash P, same here, you know, P plus, that sort of thing. These are these will work in both Lexus and Westlaw. Actually, so will that one. Um, and make sure, as you, as I said before, that if you want one term and another term rather than or, that you put either an ampersand or the word and in between the things, because Westlaw is weird and has or as a default for some stupid reason. And things like library search and Google and Lexus, you can get away with putting just a space between your search terms, but you can't in here. So just be really careful about that. It's a new and annoying feature of the new platform. Um, so I think <coughs> tripped a few people up. Yeah, so. The, oops, sorry. Does that kind of help explain things? Yeah. Excellent. Um, the other thing too is your history. And what I didn't realize was also include the history of when you do searches on um, the international platform, which surprised me immensely. So search histories, for example. If so we jump into a previous search earlier, actually, oh, it's just a recent one, that's probably why. There we go. This is my entire search history in the last month. So I was hoping that it would show you some international ones. But of course, because I've done a whole 10 billion tutorials recently, it's got sort of chock full of New Zealandy things. that does actually do international things as well, which I was surprised about. But say, for example, we wanted to go back to my old search about citing references on, NZ, on section 14 of NZ4. We could just go straight back there by just going through my own search history. So yeah, if it does, if you've done a search before, you can actually go through your search history and look at it again. Um, you can favorite particular items and you can also create folders as well from within um, the database. So that could be useful as well. Other thing you could do too is look at things by practice area. So for example, if you were doing, I don't know, environment, click on environment and resources, and it will come up with all various different things that target to that particular area. Ditto family, um, employment, that sort of thing. But generally speaking, I go through content type because it seems to be easier. Um, so that's very briefly um, Westlaw. Also, if you're doing a lot of research, like you go and do PhDs or um, full, full masters where you've no taught papers, like full research masters, you can actually create alerts where if you've done a search, you can get it to just tell you when there are more results that fit that particular criteria. Um, so that might be useful as well. And I'll just keep an eye on that. Excellent. Okay, so we'll stop with Westlaw now because that's probably quite enough of um, Westlawing. And strangely, we're going to go and look at international case law and Alexis. Um, Cool. Actually, before I do that, I'll just check. Have you guys used the thing in the International Cases Advanced Search Template and searched across a whole bunch of jurisdictions at the same time? Do you guys know how to do that? Before I show you something you already know anyway? No? Yes? I, I haven't done that before. Cool, okay, I'll go with the go then. 
Yeah, I just didn't want to show you stuff that, particularly the things like Lexus and Westlaw, that you reuse a thousand times because that kind of seems unhelpful. Um, so this is the other way to get to all the library databases. So rather than going through subject portals, go through databases and then law. And this gives you the full list of legal databases. So this is all of them. So we'll jump down to our friend Lexus. And wait for a little bit. Cool. Actually, this is something that took me, again, shamefully long to figure out. Um, it was actually only like later, earlier this year, and I've used Lexus for, you know, this version of Lexus for about five years. So, um, it's not good that I didn't figure it out earlier. So if you want to search a whole bunch of countries at once, you can actually use an international cases search template. And it does them all simultaneously. Well, Canada, US, us, Australia, the US, and England anyway. So you can do just a keyword search, search a particular case, that sort of thing. And I am going to do... I'm trying to leave a person who's within the same paragraph. Okay, I'm going to see what happens. So I'm not sure how often this has come up, but we'll give it a go and see what happens. So it gives you a snapshot of the different countries it's covering. Um, there are a couple of cases in Canada that have used these, these things in particular. So what I was telling the database is to look for legal personhood in the same paragraph as the term animal. Um, and it's given us a whole bunch of, um, well, it's given us a couple of results from Canada anyway. Though strangely, I would have thought it would be more um, than that, but that's all right. Probably if you had an S after the animal, it would, uh, it, you might get more. Possibly, but I think it should, it should have um, just picked up plurals though. It's usually smart enough to do that. No, it did. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that weird? Only one. Because I know there are a couple of cases in New York. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I don't think it's searching America. I thought it did, but it actually isn't. It's just searching Canada, the UK, us, Australia, right. and Hong Kong for some reason. There is a way of doing US that I'll show you how to do that separately. Um, but what I might do is I might jump back and actually do a different search. A bit more boring the search, but still, you know. I'll just do direct search. searches. That comes up with bloody weird. <laughs> Hang on, I'll go back to the international template. Although if you guys want me to search for particular things, feel free to tell me and I'll just search for those things. Um, that's fine. I'm just, these are just examples I had in my head rather than being anything particularly hard and fast I was worried about searching. So hopefully I've just told to search for director and fiduciary duty anywhere in the same, um, same document. And now we're getting back bazillions of cases. Um, so again, this is where you think, okay, that's ridiculous. Who wants that many cases? Let's do it in the same sentence. I'm hoping it won't actually just do the UK. It will have to come up. Okay, now it's just one of the UK. That's annoying. 
Okay, so that's actually good to know. When you adjust your searches in here, it will just for some reason default with the UK. So you've actually got to go back to the original search box and do it again. So just be aware of that. I had suspected that because I had a little UK flag up there. So now I'm telling it to put in the same sentence. And I mean, there are still ridiculous numbers of cases, but there aren't 10,000. So for example, if you want to see the Canadian cases on that topic, you jump into Canada and it would go straight to the Canadian materials. And then you could click on the links to various versions that are sitting in this database. So that's just a really quick way of doing those other jurisdictions, those other Commonwealth jurisdictions, um, in one, one shot, effectively. If you're looking for US in particular, though, um, there is actually a US research part. So you click on that little thing with the dots, jump down to the US research. And having looked for stuff for gay in the past in this database, I know there's stuff on legal personhood and animals in here. So here we have like 84 cases that use those two terms, which is quite a lot. I'm surprised about that, but okay. So for example, we'll just jump into this, this one here. And you can see here, there are, um, I think there has one little, asterisks and sometimes it has two. That's just an indication of where the various page numbers start. So for example, the slip opinion version, page one will start there. And so every now and then you'll see little numbers with either one asterisk or two beside them. That's where page six of the, that particular version starts. So it's just to keep a tab on where the different page number starts is slightly annoying and confusing. But that's just what those numbers mean if you are using things from Lexis. Personally, if you download a PDF version of the document, I would do that because it's a hell of a lot less confusing. But yeah, that's just how it works. Yeah, I'll just jump into the version now. So does that make sense? So far. So yeah, just um, um so can you save the searches? Do they automatically save in Lexis or in theory? Let's see if we'll go into my history. Eh? Yeah, it does. If you go up to the history, it'll save itself. Cool. Um I'll go back to the New Zealand one and see if it's actually saved itself in New Zealand history as well. This is NZ research. Good question, Elsie. So here we go. So yeah, it has it saved itself into my actual research history. If I clicked on that again, it will bring you bring you back those US research results. So again, if you've done a search in the US bit recently, um, and it appears in your New Zealand history, like in your normal Lexus history, if you click on it, it'll take you back to that original US search. Cool. Thanks. Cool. Excellent. That's good. Um, yeah, and I might just have a quick look in the international arm of West Law as well, just to in case you guys need some help with that. Oops, stupid thing. Mm. Okay, so we're gonna to go to Thompson Reuters West Law just very briefly. Public databases. Mm. Here 
my touch bro this one. So this is the um, international arm of Westlaw effectively. When you jump into it, again, it gets you to log in, so it's actual search history and whatnot. Hopefully it actually worked properly this time, but we'll see. Wait for a sec, hopefully it'll, it'll play nicely. Okay, so when you go to the front page of Westlaw, Thompson Reuters Westlaw, or as I occasionally call it Westlaw International, because it used to be called that, um, this will give you a bunch of stuff about America. So if you do a search just in here now, what you'll get back is US North American material. If you want something other than that, click on international materials and that will give you the other jurisdictions. So things like the EU, um, again, those Australia, Canada, Hong Kong, blah, 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 those sorts of jurisdictions will turn up here. And say we wanted to go to the UK. And UK with statutes. The UK statutes has got this really useful thing where if you do a search in the statutes, it'll actually bring you back um, you can click on a button and bring back related case law and things, much like you can for the New Zealand material. So I might just do. And I'm hopefully, I'm hoping that it appears in the UK legislation as well. I'm assuming it will, because they're probably based off the same UN. So it's brought back a whole bunch of things about freedom of expression. So here we have, we'll just jump into this, the statute there. And um, obviously you can download the PDF itself, or if you click on analysis, you get related material. So it gives you commencement details, cases cited, journal articles, other bits and pieces that are in um, this database. So yeah, that's just if you are doing, looking for stuff on the UK, like materials based on particular, I mean, cases based on particular statutes in the UK, this is a way of doing that in kind of an easy way. And it's not something I'm sure ever, I'm not particularly convinced everybody knows about it. So I thought I'd, I'd clue you guys in because they had you. And jumping back to international materials. There are also some secret treatises on this database as well. So we've got treatises, say for example, like I would go UK again. There are a whole bunch of things that we used to have as books that now we have online instead. So things like Palmer's Company Law, if you are for some reason doing that area of law, various criminal procedure things, a patients thing. So if you bits and pieces like that, jump back to say. Oh, did you? What was that? Um, case summaries for what jurisdiction? Sometimes if you go to the actual particular, particular case itself, it'll summarize it at the top. Um, some countries do have things like digests and stuff that summarize cases as well. So it really depends what you want. In fact, pretty sure Canada has a digest. So something like the Canadian Encyclopedic Digest will go through various topics of Canadian law and summarise cases to deal with those um, 
areas of law similarly to sentencing digest will do sentencing stuff that sort of thing is that your kind of meaning um by the way, it's current law used to use to digest things, but now you really find them more in terms of if you're looking at a particular case, you'll see at the top of the case itself, it'll summarize it for you. You don't necessarily see case summaries in the way of say something like student companions, which do it on particular areas of you know, like family law or company law or things like that. I think in terms of, in terms of summarizing cases for your research for like studying and whatnot, the student companions are still your best option. Does that help? Cool, excellent. So anyway, so here's some yeah, various treaties and whatnot, or treatises rather, so books effectively on various areas of law. So again, that's not something that's really obvious that we have, because that this stuff's hard to link in library search because they don't use those good records, but it is still there. Cool, excellent. Okay, so I'll stop talking about things you, you know, things I'm, these databases now. Um, have you guys seen LawSight? It's one of those like free case citation databases. If not, I'll show you. It's sort of attached to like Osley and Zedley and those types of things. So I'm literally just going to Google it because I know that it'll come up if I Google it. Um, so it's lawsight.org. Um, yeah, literally, I just Googled it. I mean, I think you probably can get to it through Osley or those sorts of Lee ones, but um, I just tend to find it easier to do it this way. I'm going to look for a couple of cases. I'm going to use New Zealand example first. And I'm just going to do Dr. Hugh and Stevenson because there'll be billions of things that's like that. So I'm doing Takamura and Clark first. And just type the parties in yourself rather than trying to guess because it never works out right if you try and guess. And as you can see, it's brung, it's brought back a whole bunch of cases in that line of um, cases. Uh, the top two were the ones that have been cited the most. The top topmost one has been cited 86 times. So it's what we're going to look at. And so it does it in terms of case that reuse this case, law reform reports. June articles, legislation, cases cited. So, for example, a bunch of different law reform report, reports have used this case for some reason or another. A bunch of different journal articles have used it as well. And in fact, where the citations in green like this, the actual the actual um, article itself is actually on on NZ, NZLE actually, and it tells you the jurisdiction it comes from as well, and also the which LE it sits on. So even if after you've stopped studying here and stop having access to our expensive databases, things like this are still accessible to you because they are freely available online. So for example, if we wanted to read that, um, this top journal article here from the Vic Law Review from a couple of years ago, we could click on this, click on the citation, which I should have done in the first place. And here you'll have a version of the article, hopefully a scanned PDF, but we'll see. So anyone can read these, like you could send this to your mum and your mum could read it. Whereas, you're, unless they're actually also staff members or students here, they wouldn't have access to our databases like Hine or Lexis or Westlaw or things like that. So again, it's just a way of making our legal information and legal scholarship much more available to the world at large. Um, you know, just that principle of people knowing that it's good that people know what the law actually is. And I'll do John and Stevenson as well, just because I know there'll be billions of things that cite it. You know, I tend to just type things in myself. It doesn't work properly, even it looks like it's going to predict, predict what you want. 
So Donna Hewitt Stevenson has got 157 citations in this database. And it actually gives you a bunch of different alternate citations as well. Obviously, that's just a vanilla um, unreported citation, but it gives you all the various law report citations too. Although it won't give you the actual full text versions of those, obviously. It lists them by most recently cited first. So, for example, this was used in England, obviously, this yeah, in February this year. So it's still being cited globally, probably most of the Commonwealth jurisdictions, to be fair, even recently, you know, last couple of years, in fact. And again, because these are all different cases that are in all the leads, you can go straight to the case itself. This one here, it's got a free version in one of the leads, probably, mainly. And it's also, it tells you there's an all the version and there's a Lloyd Law Report version as well, which you'll have to find on an expensive database. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a surprisingly useful resource, and it's probably something that we should be more um, overt about telling students about because it is really good. Um, particularly, this is a quick and dirty you know, way of finding a whole bunch of stuff. Obviously, if you were going to use one of these reported cases, particularly in real life, you go and find the real proper reported version. So, for example, if you want to track down Minister of Environment and Sharma, you'd probably go and find the ALR version from, um, I think it's on Lexus. Yeah, rather than using the unreported version, but at least, you know, if you were a poor struggling lawyer who couldn't afford the ridiculous costs of Westlaw and Lexus, this would be a backstop option. Or if you were just a person in the world who happened to be interested in law for the hell of it, again, you could read this all day and night to your eyes bleed. Um, so yeah, just a, a fun thing to know about. Right. Sorry, just making waking my notes up again. Actually, do you guys know about Cardiff and Dexter legal abbreviations? Because if you don't, that's another thing that probably will blow your minds. Um, cool. Excellent. Okay, so a bit of a mixed bag on that one, so I'll quickly show you. Again, it's one of those ones where if you've got some sort of really obscure law report abbreviation, like say, for example, you didn't know what ALJR stood for, and you want to know what it stood for, you could pop that into Cardiff and it will tell you. Um, there is a New Zealand version called LCANS, which covers the bulk of the international stuff as well, but I think Cardiff might be slightly better. It's linked off the portal under dictionaries, but again, it's freely available online, so I'm just going to Google it. So it comes out of the University of Cardiff, oddly enough. Um, I've used it for a few years now. And for me, I just find it really useful. If I don't quite know what an abbreviation is, um, I'll pop it in here. So there you go. I think it's actually stands for Australian Law Journal Reports, but, um, you know. Oh, good. It stands for Australian Law Journal Reports. Brilliant. So... And the, it usually you run off the preferred abbreviation. Sometimes you'll see it cited these other things weirdly. It tells you which jurisdiction to look in, which sometimes help you work out which database to go and find it in as well. Um, I think this actually lives in Lexus. I mean, in Westlaw rather. I'm not 100% certain. But we could actually, if we jump back into Westlaw again, I've still got my New Zealand Westlaw open, but you can actually jump jurisdictions. So using the regional drop down, um, click on Australia, and it opens up Australian Westlaw instead. So blah, blah, blah. And we could just type in AJ. See that comes up. Cool. 
So there you go. So we actually have bothered to type it in properly. It says Australian Law Journal reports do live in um, the Australian bit of West, West Law. So we jump in there. And then we could have actually found that particular case um, there as well. So yeah, just be aware that if you were looking for the Australian material, um, that you need to switch jurisdictions. Actually, if we go back to our history now, hopefully it will show me my international history too. Here we go. So see in our history now, before it was just showing me New Zealand stuff because it just does the most recent things. But it's actually looking at it is actually showing us that stuff we did and we saw earlier. So if you've been doing searches on the international platform and you're back in your New Zealand platform, you can actually go into your history and get leapfrogged into your old search, um, which is something that took me about two years to figure out. So I'm just telling you guys now, so you don't have to take two years to figure it out yourselves. Okay. Um, so okay, that's some of the some of the things I was going to look at. Um, what areas of law are you guys doing anyway? Because we've got an hour, so we could we'll probably cover a few different bits and pieces. So I'll go. I'll take you through the whole comprehensive list of legal databases, and we might run through a few extra bits and pieces as well, and also show you things like the Research Commons and Research.org. And also I have a put, put look at some international stuff in a style guide too. Cyber and cyber law. Uh, excellent. Well, in that case, things like um, Google Scholar might be quite good for you if you're doing sort of general sort of searching on stuff. Um, but also uh, globalregulation.org too, I shall take you to the full list. Sorry, it's taking ages. Okay, so back at the main library page again now. Databases. All of the law ones. So. Actually, if you, particularly if you're going to be around for a while doing like graduate research and masters and whatnot, um, and you want to keep the rest of legal issues in New Zealand, you can actually sign up for the Capital Law Leader newsletter. Just go into the database and click up, click on sign up to newsletter or something to that effect. And make sure you use your YCASHO email address. And it will send you stuff every day about new cases and new developments and areas of law in New Zealand. So that's quite interesting. Um, oops. I actually want to click on that. Um, if you're doing European law, and probably some of that cybersecurity stuff will come into that as well, if you're doing data protection and things, um, EULEX is really good. Again, it's a really good sort of one-stop shop for treaties, regulations, that type of thing, case law. Um, if you want to do a cross-comparison of stuff from a bunch of different jurisdictions, Okay. You know, the story like is online. Um, it actually it is actually based on the Australian one as well, to be completely honest. And you're right, it doesn't cover some of the things the Australian cover, what guide does cover. But probably it's if you guys are citing stuff here, you need to start with that. Um, because you guys are here, <laughs> not in Australia. But yeah, as you say, if you go, if something's not covered with a style guide, perhaps then turn to something like the Australian, Australian version. So that aside, um, global regulations a database that covers legislation from a whole bunch of different countries, and it's used by a whole bunch of different organisations, weirdly including Uber. Um, so if we did just a search for. I don't know, free expression. So 
So it's telling the database to go, go away and search all those countries for anything that uses those words. And it does it by alphabetical. I mean, there's thousands of results because it's a ridiculous search. But um, if you were doing a more targeted um, type of search, you might come up with something a bit more sensible. So for example, if you wanted to do doing a study about something like Denmark, it's got Danish legislation, or English translations of Danish legislation. And because it's just doing every single word, the ones near the top of the list will be most relevant. So it, it'll actually more likely to include all of them. Whereas some of the ones further down might just include some or the other. So just be aware of that. And you probably do a more advanced search as well to do a bit more honed um, things. In fact, we could try cybersecurity to see what comes up. So here we go. We've got, I just did cybersecurity as a search as a, as a complete guess. And a whole bunch of countries have something to do with that area. And again, lists them alphabetically. So for example, if you want to see what the what Belize had to say about it, I just mentioned the word cyber in one of the legislation, but acts rather. So yeah, if you are doing that cross-jurisdictional stuff and you want something that just it does everything at once, try there. Um, it's worth having a look at. Are any of you guys doing environmental law? Because if you are, there's actually a really good free resource called Ecolex, and it's a bit like Eulex, and it covers a whole bunch of treaties and texts and whatnot. Um, I might just quickly show you that. So if you were doing environmental law, um, this is quite a good thing to use. So it gives you treaties, it gives you decisions, it gives you legislation for a bunch of jurisdictions, cases, literature, that sort of thing. So we just do a search on rivers, which is again very broad and stupid search to do. But say for example, we go treaty decisions. It's got a whole bunch of different decisions. Or example, jurisprudence. So again, a bunch of cases and whatnot. And literature. So here we have doing lot of calls, that sort of thing. So yeah, about your freezing tigers over this group. So all sorts of different bits and pieces in here. It's worth having a quick look anyway, if you are working in that area. And equally, if you're working in, within European materials, Euroleaks is really good for that sort of thing as well. Right. Um, the other thing that's worth having a quick look at is, in terms of our library website, that like the Research Commons, that has all of our theses and a whole bunch of research from our people at Waikato as well. Do you mean does international law have um, cases and things the same as we do, Jacob? Is that what you're, is that what you're asking? Hi. Um, yeah. No. Okay, um, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, you you showed us a database on environment law. Yeah. Is there a, something of similar nature for international law? Depends what it is. Like something like international criminal court has one. It has got a secret thing that's where it's, it's website. What area of international law you're after? All of them. Um, like there's a, there's a trade law one. There's a, oh, I might go back to that whole list of databases. Eh? Um, 
So it really, really depends. Um, but there isn't one that's called intralex, if you were, if you know what I mean, not for every area of every aspect of international law, because that would be crazy. Whereas ecolex is just environmental, so even though it's international, it's just still one area of international law. Um, but so, for example, if you were looking for stuff from the ICJ, there's a, there's a database for that. I mean, worldly, I guess, does international law. It does international case law and stuff. That's one of those free databases. There's a UN database for UN things. Um, if you're doing WTO, there's a database for that. Oh, sweet. Yeah, Thank so I think like that. And if you and if you look on the ICC website, there's actually a really good a bunch of case law and commentary and stuff there that's kind of hidden away. Um, so if you want, if you're doing international criminal law, I'll show you how to do that because I found I literally found it accidentally one day. Can can you apply the same principles you, you did with the same database, e.g., have like keywords we can find? So if I so if I wanted to go into the IC, the ICC yep. and, yep. and strike in strike in keywords such as um uh, uh um human rights or yeah woman human rights. Is it, does it have the same sort of theory? Yeah, except it might not do, you know, it'll do like the thing with the double quote marks and the and or the or. It won't necessarily do that slash five and slash p nonsense that's particular to those ridiculously expensive Lexis and Westlaw type databases. So you can type, say, human rights and double quote marks to keep those words together and women, and it will search for cases around human rights and women you know, to get you know specifically but you don't think you can necessarily do human rights backslash s woman to make it do it in the same sentence it might confuse the database it's not quite as sophisticated perfect thank you for yeah. that does that make sense makes perfect sense i wish i knew that stuff as an undergrad <laughs> i know I, I really do wonder whether we shouldn't run some sort of thing over even in summer or something if people would come for undergrads yeah, that's something I might get your guys' opinion on actually later on at the end of this, um, when I stop recording. <laughs> it's about whether you think it's been good earlier on, perhaps. Right. Um, actually, going through the list of databases. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of different bits and pieces there. Again, you read official documents. There's a whole, yeah, there's a whole sort of treasure trove of things, really. Oops. Sorry, my stupid phone thing. Um, actually, if you're looking for materials for the Pacific law in particular, the main database is terrible for the Pacific material, but Packley is probably your best bet. It's one of those freely databases. Um, and people are often asking me about Pacific material, so I thought I'd throw it in what I thought about it. Again, worldly is all the leads combined into one giant Lee. Um, if you're doing UN treaties, the UN treaty collection is quite good. And the UN website generally is actually quite good for stuff. Yeah, so that's that's kind of you know, some of the database that might be good for various things. I'll quickly show you the ICC secret tool. Um, so, I'll show you how to get there from the main website in a second, but I literally found this by clicking around on the website one day, as I do, um, because I can't leave well enough alone. <laughs> and so this is a whole bunch of cases and stuff that have gone through the International Criminal Court, um, various bits and pieces. In fact, if we do a search for women. And then just in case it's a bit bulky, it should do it. And there we go. I've now made it bring back the stuff about women and human. There's still 20,000 things. So you might want to do a slightly more nuanced search than that. But yeah, so. As a quick and dirty look at some various things, that's probably quite 
a useful thing. Then we can jump into say women's rights or human rights from the UN and look, literally click on the item. Then you can get taken to a PDF, hopefully. No, you don't, no, you don't log into it. It's just a um, free website off the ICC. So hopefully, you can just download that. I'm going to open. Ah, uh, there we go. That makes virtually no sense whatsoever, but okay. And here's the actual document itself. So it has two tabs. One's the information tab, and one's if you click on open PDF, it gives you the actual PDF. Does that make sense? Now, and I'll jump back to the ICC's website, main site. Oh, actually, if you click on CLD, that's a case law database. So again, you can run that same search in the case law database as well. So I'll show you how to get there from the main international criminal court website. So here we have the Interstitial Criminal Court. Wait for a bit before it to come in. All right. So under documents, case law database or core legal texts. That's weird. Where we are. That kind of makes sense, sort of. And that's just the home for the ICC website more generally. So it is there, but it is um, otherwise, as you just do what I did in the first place and Google ICC legal tools, it'll come up straight away without having to go into this main data, main website, website. Okay, so that was that page. But going back now to our main library site, I was going to show you the research commons, which again, as I was saying before, is the repository of our theses, um, like master and PhD theses, and also a bunch of journal articles and stuff from people who've, who work here. So we'll go to resources, research commons. And I'll just do a quick search on cybersecurity because I know there's stuff on there. In a way, I'm sorry, it's been ages. So if you want to search for search our theses, explore our theses collection. If you want to do like journal articles and stuff written by staff members, it's explore our research. If you want to do everything, it's to type up there. Um, And I'm going to make that search for those words in their order together. So it's the, it's the whole of research commons, theses, journal articles, whatever. And so I'm going to read about cybersecurity vulnerabilities in Tonga. Click on the article. We can see it's a conference proceedings. It's been downloaded 400 times in the last year. And you can download yourself there. So that's just like, you know, a way of um, looking for stuff that's been written here. 
if again you're going to do go on to do your PhD or um, even a, a full master's, or just want to see what a full master would look like in terms of formatting and stuff, you can search for things in the Research Commons and have a look at examples of other, other people's work. It's just as a, a guide to how you might want to set yours out too. So I thought I'd show you that. Um, the other thing I might show you, even though it's probably teaching you sucky slightly, is Google Scholar. So Google Scholar is kind of the arm of Google that can actually search in our databases and stuff and actually get scholarly materials. And for some reason, American case law. Um, it doesn't talk to our databases by default. So you might hit paywalls if you just do stuff in Google Scholar without setting it up deliberately first. But the way of doing that is to click on this three bar thingy then click on settings, then library links. And obviously I have set up all for myself because I'm, you know, even just type Waikato in actually. And obviously we're here, so we would tick the University of Waikato and would save it. But if you were saved, you, you happen to be at one tier, yeah, you, where when Tech said, yeah, you know, they've got a version, DHB's got one. But because we're we are Waikato people, we log in through Waikato, and that's all we need to tick. And click on save. And now when you do a search in Google Scholar, if the it's in our database as well, it'll either give you a click on PDF type option or it will just ping you th straight through. Okay, excellent. So here we have a whole bunch of different things um, about legal person and animals. You can actually, if you want to save particular results, so if like, oh, that's a great article, but I'll forget that it exists later on, you can literally click on save and it saves them into your results. And you can actually create little um, folders and stuff as well. So class will do Done. And then to access stuff you've saved previously, go to my library and that's where your stuff will be. So for example, this one here is in Taylor and Francis, which is one of our databases. Clicking on it, it pings us straight through into the database itself. Whereas if you hadn't done that stupid thing with the ticking Waikato first, you probably be paywalled at this point and be told you couldn't access the article, but because you it knows you're a Waikato person, it will um, let you in. Particularly if you're already logged into Waikato stuff in a different tab like I am. Hey, um, yeah. Will Will Google Scholar uh, remember uh, that you're a Waikato person no matter what? Uh, place you're logging in from? Uh, or it's, what? It's, it's particular to yeah. your particular browser or computer. It's really annoying. So for example, right. I mean, obviously if you're on campus, it remembers anyway, but say if you're using yeah, yeah. at your mum's house and using a computer at home, you'd need to set it up at both places. So it's right. particular to your specific. And what, what if you were in like London? And it's fine. It's always, yeah. If you're, if you took, if you're yeah. taking your own computer to London and set up, that would still remember. If you were using a public library in London, you'd need to set it up again, probably. Right. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Excellent. No worries. It's all good. Um, as you can tell, I have a really um weird and chill approach to this. <laughs> I just make up stuff as I go along. Right, back to my notes again. Um, yeah, so I just thought that might be useful for you guys to know about, particularly the in terms of logging on thing, because it's something that people do tri get tripped up on. Um, actually, the other fun thing that I'm not sure people necessarily realize is that you can see other stuff that's cited a particular source. So, for example, this particular book here has been cited by 158 different people in Google Scholar. So these are things that are also in Google Scholar. There might be more things that aren't in Google Scholar that have cited this, but this is a decent indication of some of the stuff that might be useful for you to read as well. 
So again, that's another useful thing um, in terms of finding related material on your particular area. So yeah, those are the main things I want to show you there. Um, nzresearch.org.nz is another one that deals with, um, that has the information from all the different like research common equivalents from across the country. So again, that might be quite useful to look at. So we research.org.nz, we'll just throw in the good personhood as our little search. Except we need to spell it correctly. So here we have 14 different items that have that somewhere in them. And it is a mix of different bits and pieces from different places. So sometimes it's theses, Sometimes it's journal articles, it really depends. It's, and it's just pulling it from the research common equivalents from across the country. So again, another good way of getting New Zealand research in one easy place that's freely accessible. And because it's coming from the research common equivalents, generally speaking, it means it's free for anyone to access. So again, if you were for some reason outsourcing your research to your younger siblings and they weren't students here, um, you could they could use things like researchcommons.org without having to use a part use now and password. Is that making sense so far? Hopefully. Cool. Um the other thing I was gonna quickly look at is some of the international stuff in the style guide, because people get confused about where it is. So I was going. Yeah, more foundation style. Like obviously, I look it up too much because it comes straight up when I Google it, which is possibly not a good thing. Jump into the table of contents and jump down for some of those international materials. So obviously, if you're dealing with legislation in case of particular jurisdictions, there's some guidance in the style guide there. But in terms of things like treaties, you go to the treaties, but if you're using things from the ICJ or the Permanent Court of Justice, again, there's information there. UN documents in 10.41, EU materials, so sort of economic materials. So it is all there. Well, a bunch of that sort of stuff is there. It's just hidden in a stupid place. Um, and it's a bit annoying to eat around. So, for example, if you were citing a resolution from the UN, that's the field you'd fill in. There's some examples there. Other stuff from the UN with document numbers and whatnot, tells you how to do those. And just a law commission, there's stuff there as well. So there's a bunch of stuff there. It's just kind of hidden in a weird place. Um, and people often ask me how to cite international materials, and I just had to, I had to go look up the style guide myself because I don't have that memorized. I'm not that good, but um, that's just where it lives. In case you do need to know, and it's sort of bamboos on you something more. Um, what else are we going to cover? Yeah, so that were the main things I was going to look at. Is there anything else you guys want to know about? Um, hang on, sorry. Cool. That um, I haven't covered so far because I can just cover extra stuff. Or anything you want me to go back to? NZ Research. NZ Research, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this literally is just the stuff on the institutional repositories. So it won't include stuff where researchers have published in journal articles, journals that are too evil to let you put in the research repository. So things like, you know, stuff, stuff that's hidden away in paid databases won't necessarily be here. Or that version certainly won't be here because of stupid publisher um, restrictions. But um, the free versions will be if they can have a freely available version. Uh, also, you can actually look at stuff that's recently um 
being added as well, which is quite handy. Or so for example, if you look, you look at the institution, so you could see what was there from us. So we've got 14, just over 14,000 things there. Again, it's a mix of theses and journal articles and whatnot. I'm not entirely sure how they are um, listing them, but never mind. Probably from oldest first, I would be unsurprised. Again, so if you want to see all our doctoral theses that were there, we click on that. And then you click on, say, the item itself. And you get directed through to our research commons because it's one of our items. If it had been an item from somewhere else, you get, would get taken through to their effective equivalent of research commons. So it's just a way of searching everything at once and the one discovery layer effectively. So, so do do the institutions feed into this or do it's do just scraped magically? I think it's just it's just somehow magically pulling stuff in the background. I don't think that anyone manually uploads anything. That's kind of indexed away Google. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah, so in the way that, you know, if you put, Google has a magical system for indexing stuff on the internet. There's obviously um, some sort of system this website has for scraping the information from um, various different institutions. Mm. Yes, yeah, so that's how no one does it. I don't think, as far as I know, anyone actually physically sends people records or anything. It's just done by the magic of the internet. Mm. You think some complicated thing I don't know anything about. <laughs> yeah, anything else? Um, I, I have a question. It's not so much about researching, but it's more about structure. Is it okay yeah. to ask that? Yeah, not exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. Um, so I'm I'm just trying to understand because I went and saw um like student support oh, yeah. about the sort of structure. Is yeah. there a particular difference other than referencing in terms of like thesis, a illegal legal thesis, um, compared to other thesis? Has it still got the same generalized structure or is this content itself very different from other areas of the I university? mean, it still has the same sort of thing where you're still doing effectively in, in like a proposal at a proposal stage and that has various things has to go in it. In fact, what goes in the proposal is in the graduate handbook, strangely. Um, and like in terms of the way a thesis is set out, it's still just, you know, there's obvious, I'd use a lit review chapter and various different chapters to cover different aspects of whatever you're researching. So it's similar from that standpoint. But do you want me to pull something out from Research Commons to show you? Yes, would please. You that would be awesome. Excellent. And Gay, feel free to tell me if I'm wrong about that. But that's just, you know, my read on the situation. Right. Okay. This is a PhD thesis. So this is probably as hardcore as it's going to get. Um, blah, 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 blah. Legal theory that'll do. Must think about legal theory, surely. Let's see, it's Steve's thesis. I know this is the law one. It's from, it's from a few years ago, so I mean, things will change slightly in terms of being less restrictive around um, margin size and whatnot. But in terms of how you set it out. Oh, Stephen Farnworth. Yeah, yeah, I knew his thesis was there, so I was like, oh, I know it's law, it's fine, I'll just use that one. So again, a cover page, an abstract, same as every other type of thesis. But then, again, this is a PhD, so you won't need something quite so hardcore for um, a master's or a, you know, there's a research paper. Probably, yeah, that sort of thing. So that's just all stock standard nonsense that you get everywhere. Probably law is more inclined towards tables of content, I mean, tables of um, acronyms, tables of cases in particular and statutes. So those sorts of things will be particular for legal theses, but otherwise, it's fairly similar. Introduction with how you're going to, you know, with some methodology type stuff, you know, and all the various different topic areas. 
the subtype substantive topic things. Yeah. Is this is this kind of what you mean? Yeah, I was just. Oh, um, the only thing that's different is the way the bibliography set out. Okay, but the actual like terms of structuring research that's the same. Is, is, is pretty straightforward across all areas. Yeah. Of okay. And obviously, legal fine. stuff uses case law and stuff in a way that we other areas don't. And if you're doing a case analysis, it's probably written a little bit differently. But generally speaking, it's fairly similar. Would that would that be fair to say, Gay? Are you still here? Yeah, uh, yeah. I guess the tricky thing is is case and legislative analysis, which, um, you know, is a is kind of an art that you learn. Hmm. Yeah, but even within, I guess, you know, you're still structuring the actual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. That, that, that's right. I think what you pointed out is the thing that would be different would be the the case yeah. analysis and the yeah no, totally analysis. yeah if you're doing yeah, yeah like a, a your methodology was case analysis then that would be different if your methodology was something like doing questionnaires and whatnot so i mean yeah that's where the, where the difference would lie rather than in terms of structure if, if, if somebody didn't have a legal background but um they would need to and i think um there's a 500 level mm -hmm. course that aimed at people without legal background. Yeah. I'm just gonna bring them up to speed to do case analysis and legislative analysis and stuff like that. Mm. But other than that, the, uh, yeah, so, so I'm just unsure whether the question is that like, how do you do the research or how do you structure the document? The document would be structured very similarly. Mm. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. No worries. Anything else? Um, Em, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. Um, just in regards to methodology, is there somewhere where we can see all the different types of methodology so I can actually learn about everything, all the different? Well, I mean, in terms of general methodology, not necessarily legal methodology, um, there's something called Sage Research Methods. But also, if you literally look in library search, there'll be books on legal methodologies in particular. But I'll show you both things. Hang on. Um, Bring up library search for start off. So and then there's a lot on the comparative legal methodology too. Yeah. So legal research methodology. Well, there you go. Excellent. Clearly, I've searched this before because luckily Google knows. So even something like that, perhaps. Compare methodologies, a whole bunch of methodologies for legal research. You want to check for the standard book size, so it's all 3,000 of those. I mean. Is there one you recommend in particular, Gay? Because you are like a guru in the no, field. You're obviously some girl. Um, not really. Um, what I would advise is also looking at uh, some articles because sometimes um, some methodologies are just beyond the scope of of your time and word count you know yeah. so yeah. they're different they're 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 yeah so you want to tail tailor the methodologies to your uh, capacity and 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 space yeah so i, I know uh, particularly in comparative law <laughs> um so, some methodologies are are just like well yeah if i had three lifetimes but no i only have you know 12 weeks yeah, yeah. But it, yeah, so I would look at, I would also search uh, journals, particularly yeah. comparative law journals. Yes, yeah, so I think like this, should different types of methodology and comparative legal research be combined into one method to, you know, rule them all? Or even theory and practice and comparative law, things like that. There are a few things kicking around, like in terms of
general legal research methodologies, or if you want just general methodology in general without being specifically lawy, we've got this database called Sage Research Methods um, as well. I might just type in Sage because I don't know where it actually sits. And it has some things like mapping and planning and God knows what else. Podcast videos. Clearly we only go to bits of it. Yeah, so various different different types of like this is general, general, general research model, you know, models. Methods maps. There's a whole lot of other bits and pieces as well, just in case you're looking for that too. Or even something like a project planner. Um, something as simple as that might help you set you know, goals at different steps in the steps in the process. Yeah, and possibly even this visualization map just generally for research rather than, you know, it mightn't be dealing with specifically legal stuff, but it still might give you an idea about how to connect terms and ideas in a general sense that you can apply to the law later on. Um, yeah, so that might be worth looking at too, particularly if you're going to go and do like PhDs in real, really ridiculously hardcore research. Cool. Anything Thanks. Else? Thank you. No worries. I just have one more question. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, with, in terms of research, with, you know, legal research, yeah. uh, postgrad, um, yeah. is like when marking that, are they specifically looking for articles and, you know, academic publishing that's within the law so, sort of area or can, other academic sources from other areas be used as evidence and like what sort of I mean other can it just to be a whole mix to to support an I, argument or I does it have to be more focused on legal well it depends on what your topic is but I would have thought so because I mean law doesn't exist in a vacuum so yeah. you know if you're talking about some sort of crazy science topic and it was appropriate to use the science article or a medical article, or whatever, to support your particular point, you know, around what the underlying problem was. Yeah, totally. Um, because I think if you just only use things with law in the title, or, like, or hardcore law resources, and nothing outside of that, then you might miss something. Because, you know, like I say, law doesn't exist like in some crazy vacuum that outside of society, law is so incredibly intertwined into every yeah. aspect of society that I think that you almost can't avoid using things from other places. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Thanks. Yeah. Actually, Gay is a day it doesn't affect Mark things. So she would be the task than me, but would, would you agree with that, Gay? I would I wouldn't have any problem with people using outside resources, but I would have a problem if they didn't have um uh some some legal resources and um analysis in there as well. You know if if it's a if it's about a legal topic, you better it, you need both, you know, because it's to bring a unique context. And just because, like Em said, law exists in society, it doesn't exist um, like uh, physics outside of things. Um, but it, you, you, you would, you would need some law. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? If, if it, it, I, don't, I don't know what what courses you're taking, but there's there's bound to be some relevant law, and if you missed that people would notice so yes you're welcome to use um, outside sources outside you know because we do that too um, but you would need to also integrate law yeah that's what I just don't I don't want to give you a bum steer that you don't need any any uh, law at all because you uh, 
you, you would need someone. Oh, you know, I totally it, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So it's okay to, to have both, like to have something else supporting the legal argument that's not necessarily in the like a case or or something like that it's a textbook from a different area but can back up what is the legal referencing that's already there it just depends on, it just depends on what you're arguing you know if it's relevant uh like it, it might uh give you some um it might have um a theory or it might have uh, some some actual data to to back up your uh analysis you, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, yep. It'd be, I, I, yeah. It'd be very it's helpful. Yeah, it's helpful to know that. Yeah. So you definitely have legal material, and then there is possibility if there's other resources that can be relevant and find connection that they can be used as well. Uh, for me, yeah. Okay. I uh, I assume that you're taking some classes, right? Uh, um, yeah, I'm. So, I've just started, so I'm just. I'm trying to gauge in terms of what is required in terms of structure and content for post grad. Um, the research is yeah, super but helpful. What, what Thank you for the tutorial, but yeah, I just what what I do with that research, and I, I just want to make sure I'm aligning to what uh, is expected in terms of the structures as well. Yeah. What. Well, what I'm what I'm recommending to you is I can tell you what I would think would be okay for topics I teach, but I don't know what classes you're taking. But you'll have a lecturer, and that's the person who can um, tell you in this area. No, that wouldn't be appropriate because you know law is um, got heaps and heaps of different uh, specialties, like tax and you know just all kinds of different things. So. It, you're, if you're taking a course, uh, you're, 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 you would need to, um, I mean, you do a proposal and things like that, but you need to, to, to talk to your lecturer. They'll, they'll be happy to talk to you about stuff like that. And if, you, if you're uncertain about something, you know, bought, bought that off of them, get some, you know, get their feedback. That's, uh, they're more than happy to engage with you that way. And Thank that you. way, you know, what might be appropriate for one area might not be appropriate for another. Yeah. Thanks, that's helpful, thank you. Cool, anything else? Well, I wanna say thank you so much um, for doing this and um, no it's, uh, I'm sure it's very helpful to the people who came along and I'm glad it's recorded. And those of you who did come along, uh, could you please spread the word to your colleagues that uh, they need to um, have a look at this. It'll uh, make their lives a lot easier and open up a new vistas, just kind of like when uh, the telescope opened up uh, the universe to Galileo, you know, M can open up uh, our eyes to a whole universe of resources that we might not otherwise uh, run into at all, or if we did run into them, wouldn't know how to, to run around them. So, so please um, spread the word to your colleagues. Uh, and when you do see stuff um, advertised to help you out, it's usually worth uh, mm. it's usually worth a, a visit. And this this is just. Um, more evidence of that. So when you see when you see stuff that says, "Oh, there's this that's offered to help you out," gen people are generally genuinely interested in helping you out. So it's usually worth your while, the time invested. So thank you so much, Em. That's this right. is wonderful. Um, you know, it's kind of annual thing. It, 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 it's at least it's at least worthy of the Hubble and maybe the James Webb um, telescopes of. <laughs> of uh, illuminating things for us. Thank you so much. Honestly, it's my pleasure. It's all good.